Welcome to What's Next, a podcast dedicated to the future of leadership and building the capabilities to embrace the future of work. Every few weeks, we interview experts and thought leaders from around the world on their unique contribution to the fields of agility, innovation, leadership, and change. My name's Peter Holiday, and my co-host today is work futurist David Yates. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Julian Waters-Lynch, an academic, strategic designer and learning facilitator. He's currently the director of the entrepreneurship program at RMIT School of Management. His research explores the economic and social effects of emerging technology and how these changes impact the changing characters of work and organizational design. He works with the Center of Digital Ethnography, the Blockchain Innovation Hub, and the Center for Urban Research at RMIT. So please sit back and enjoy today's podcast. So... I'm going to ask a couple of questions straight off the bat because, Jules, I don't know you and you and Pete obviously go way back. Um, Tell me about what you're doing at the moment and kind of where you're situated. Yeah, so I'm the director of the entrepreneurship program at RMIT. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm an academic, uh, work at a major Australian university, so academics tend to split their time between research and teaching and, you know, looking for grant money and program leadership, things like that. It's a pie chart that normally looks like, you know, different percentages allocated to research, teaching, or what they call leadership, which a lot of it's admin. Um, <laughs> and the, yeah, so that's what I do. That's my day job. I also cool. do a bit of um, sort of consulting and other things around that through, through a, a business we run. Yep. Um, and I'm in Ocean Grove. So I live, it's two hours out of Melbourne. Awesome. Yep. Very nice. Yep. Now, I'm, I'm RMIT alum. Um, out of the, s- the School of Communication Design. Where does the, where, what school does the entrepreneurship discipline sit in? Business? School of Management. School so of the management. university's yep. split into three colleges. Yep. I mean, universities are kind of like cities, right? You know, they've got different suburbs and there's the, the cool mm-hmm. ones and the less cool ones and the, you know, the prestigious ones and all that, right? So when we say, although most people here are, uh, like think of the Halo brand, Harvard or Oxford or, you know, and think... Um, the reality is some parts of some universities are great and others not, not so. The School of Media Comms at RMIT is very well regarded, actually. Mm. But the college is, is split into, sorry, the university is split into three colleges. So the, the College of Science, Technology, Engineering, you know, the STEM stuff, the School of Design and Social Context, where you would have been situated, yep. sorry, the college rather. And then there's a College of Business and Law. And mm. within that, I'm in the School of Management. Yeah, okay. So my field is management. I mean, entrepreneurship's an interesting, it's a funny old field in academia because it's kind of this outgrowth of management, Mm. you know, and and some sit somewhere between economics and management. Mm. Mm. And um, how have you, um, I'm thinking back to when I did do an elective at RMIT on entrepreneurship and sat there, um, this was decade and a half ago now, but sat there frustrated at the fact that we were talking a lot about traditional R&D processes rather than what I considered to be entrepreneurship at the time. What's changed and shifted in that space, particularly around the way a university looks at entrepreneurship? So this was like 15 years yeah. ago? You were yeah, talking? yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know what course you did. Um, try and truncate this because I could, I could say a lot of this. <laughs> um, well, I guess the question I is: the question is, what, what's changed over the last, let's call it, decade? What's changed over the last decade in the way a university sees entrepreneurship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think a lot has. I mean, the, the, a lot's changed in the culture, right? And mm. when I grew up in the 1980s in Australia, entrepreneurs, or well, I thought of them as dodgy dudes that wore white suits that built, you know, bad um, housing developments or complexes in the Gold Coast, and then pissed yeah. off to Spain <laughs> to avoid tax or whatever. Right? Well, so, let's be honest; some um, of it's still like that. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like we, the WeWork guys, pretty yeah. much. That's it, right? It's yeah. Alan Bond and Christopher Scase all over again. Yeah, um, just a bit younger so and a bit still, better looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, better hair, right? Um, very good hair. Uh, so, but clearly, like. The, the idea of entrepreneurship and the presence of it in the culture is much different. I mean, a lot of students have come through there and in my course, they're heroes, Elon Musk. And, mm. and look, I think there's, there's some good and bad of that. I mean, it's on one level, the kind of things Musk is doing is, is much better than what um, Christopher Scase or Alan Bond were up to in terms of their interesting businesses that contribute a lot. 
the the downside I think is we've got this heroic um, kind of billionaire class, right, shooting phallic rockets into space in the, <laughs> the sort of most epic midlife crises ever. Um, so th there's, a, there's a lot of down to, and I, I would like to talk later about um, the the way that those aspects warp what's going on in the space and, mm. you know, where I think we should be directing resources. Mm. Um, but in terms of universities, like RMIT was actually quite early. This isn't sort of a, a um, parochial point, but they were one of the earlier ones along with Swinburne to offer entrepreneurship courses in Australia. Um, so right back in 2005, I don't know if you were doing an elective on that. Um, and it was sort of seen as this weird area, right? You know, well, um, but over the last 10 years, that's really shifted. So most universities now have accelerator programs. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sort of MAP, Melbourne uh, University has one. But they all have them, right? And they're modelled more on Y Combinator. Um, they're, they're clearly not as good. They're not pumping out. They're not as prestigious. They're not pumping out Airbnbs yet. They don't um, hand over 150 grand and take a 7% stake? Uh, well, they've got different models. They tend not to. They're not. They tend not to be equity um, yeah, based okay. like that. Yep. Um, but if you think about it, I mean, there were there were old school kind of business incubators for decades. But mm. the modern accelerator phenomenon pretty much goes back to Y Combinator and yeah. 2005 moment. Right. Yep. So it, universities all around the world have been trying to do this, and I think they should. I mean, we like if you look at Stanford. Um, I mean, let's look at Google. I mean, that was a project that was um, a PhD project by two students at Stanford. Mm. Now, imagine if Stanford had just had have taken equity in, in now Alphabet. Mm -hmm. uh, I, to my knowledge, they didn't. Um, and Larry and Sergey left. And at a certain point, they went, you know, we could um, write some cool papers about this algorithm or we could make a billion, you know, like, <laughs> choices. <Dollars. laughs> yeah. You've got a trillion dollar company now. Um, but I'm a big fan of the idea that both universities and governments should actually um, take more of an equity stake mm. in things they fund in the early stage. Yep. You know, and again, we can get into the, why that is, but mRNA would be another, mRNA tech would be another candidate there. I mean, we're seeing now the, 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 the impact of, of that with the COVID vaccines from Pfizer and BioNTech and Moderna. Mm. This is research that ha was happening for decades, publicly funded in universities. Mm. Um, so, sorry. That's a kind of soapbox point, but I think it's it's it speaks to the power of um, science based particularly and and heavily research based ideas that then become commercialized. Mm. And you know who who funds that initially, including all the losers. The, the, I don't want to say losers, <laughs> but the things we fund that don't become commercially viable. You know that you still have to in order to find the one in a hundred or one in a thousand sort of ideas that can be incredibly lucrative. Um, I don't think the taxpayers get enough um, general return mm. for when we, we put money into um, basic research and then that one in a thousand ideas uh, exploited by, by great entrepreneurs. Mm. And they become fabulously wealthy and a bunch of venture capitalists become really well off too and then maybe, maybe the mums and dads can, can participate in an IPO that, that's heavily watered down and all the rest. So. Yep. Wow, I'm just launching um, no. 8.30 in the morning and uh, nearly yeah. 9 now I'm <laughs> opening up two barrels. It's, it's, but to answer your question, universities now are taking this much more seriously. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. And, and one of the things that I guess you, one of the points you made before was around uh, like science-based research developing good ideas that eventually become products or services or companies or whatever. It's certainly something that coming into this space probably bottom up what well, you know i was i was the i was the kid who fell in love with um silicon valley and heroed um steve jobs and wanted to make the world a better place and when you look under the hood and when you look under the hood and finally spend some time going what is it what is the makeup that actually makes these these kind of ventures whether they're inside of an organization or a brand new startup actually work you realize the closer you get to the more successful ones, you realize just how much science and research goes into um, the, the genesis of some of these ideas in a lot of ways. Um, what, um, I guess, what have you seen that change in, in terms of the zeitgeist of what mm. people are expecting? Yeah, I've got strong and kind of unorthodox views about this. Mm. So hopefully that's okay. That's what you Please, want. To that's what I want. Yeah, so absolutely. I'll just fire Tell me I'm there. wrong. Yeah. Please. Please. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, well, I think you, you, you're mostly right. Um, the, 
yeah so where to start here so there's a there's been a view and i've been as guilty as this as anyone and pete would have seen me say this that you know we're, we're li we've been living through the most innovative time ever right you know the last 20 years and it, it's kind of a thing you hear futurists stand up on stages at commercial uh, conferences and say because it's it's a useful story to say to a bunch of people that are paid to be there and you know if you're trying to get paid to <laughs> for, for by them to tell you what to do um, rather than saying, no, we're, things are pretty cool and stable, dudes. Um, just keep doing what you're doing, right? That, that story doesn't sell as much. Um, but there's a, there's a different view, actually, that we've, we've been living through since the 1970s something of a slowdown in innovation, right? It, it, for the one exception to that that everyone would acknowledge is Moore's Law and digital technology. I mean, clearly yep. that's gone through the roof. But the way, the way I think you can get an intuitive feel of this is if you took an average household in the developed world um, from, say, 1900 and then to 1960. 1960. The average 1960 household would look like something out of the Jetsons. I mean, 1900, pre-electricity, there's no fridge, there's no telephone, there's no motor car, there's no toasters, there's no heating, you know. I mean, you, you're basically living in, in a lot of houses in a way, barely connected with sewerage, you know, um, indoor plumbing, you're not living that differently to almost centuries before. By 19, but, but, but let's do the opposite, right? Take a, an average American or Australian household in 1960 and then jump 60 years ahead to 2020. Apart from computers, I mean, there's a car, there's a telephone, admittedly a mobile one. Um, you know, the toasters aren't that, they're not that much better. The fridges mm. aren't that much better. Mm. We had even dishwashers and, and washing machines. So... The, the argument here is, I mean, and when you, when you look more at the economic history, what's sometimes called the golden age of innovation peaks at about 1930, 40. And only, only in the sense that it, it's not saying we don't get cool new stuff now. It's just that the rate of novelty at that time, I mean, we were electrifying everything. We're getting petrochemicals, you know, where um, in so much you've got in a decade, you've got television, you've got radio. This is happening like uh, several major developments each decade. Um, and the, the, there's a reason for that, um, which we can get into. So in terms of like transformational products that transform people's lives, you know, everyday lives, um, I have come to the view, uh, you know, and, and in this company is people like Peter Thiel or Tyler Cohen and, and even... Um, someone like the, his name's just escaped me, but the anthropologist that wrote Debt, the first 5,000 years, he died. Oh. But he was, he was like yep. a left-wing kind of guy, right? So you, yep. you've got characters like Peter Thiel, you know, famous libertarian venture capitalist, and this guy who I could Google his name in a second. Yes. It'll come to me. Can't um, Google the name. <laughs> yeah. It's a book called <laughs> Debt. Debt, the first 5,000 yep. years. 5,000 yep. years. Yeah, David, David Graeber, there it is. There it is, yeah. I mean, well done. Both coming to this idea that the, the vision of the 1950s, that was it was just this Jetson-like trajectory was going to continue mm -hmm. and we'd have flying cars and we'd have, you know, we'd have moon colonies and things. What the freak happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's quite a, uh, an interesting and provocative thing to sit with. Now, the reason I say that is I think this is going to be shifting in the next 10 years. I'm seeing um, some strong evidence that often what's called deep technology, um, which is hard science-based or advanced engineering-based forms of uh, technological ventures um, are stirring back up. And we're, we're probably seeing the strongest evidence of that in the field of biomedicine yeah. with CRISPR-Cas9, with, um, with mRNA technology, with even, I think it's called AlphaFold, but basically AlphaMind's um, protein folding prediction software. So part of that is because we're turning computation, the power of the accumulated power of Moore's Law, towards biology it's for other things too we're just getting you know there's, there's new discoveries that have opened up more of a read-write paradigm in biology and biotech yeah. so it'll look more like software development has mm. for the last 20 years and that's kind of what mrna tech does actually we're programming cells to express certain proteins which is just a new frontier mm. in medicine now coming back to your question so i saw what characters like steve jobs were doing is turning up as a fantastic entrepreneur, you know, a design-minded, great businessman and assembling the products of past investment into technology. Mm. So there's a great slide that Mariana Mazzucuto has where she looks at, you, might, you guys might have seen it, you look at an iPhone and you go, okay, touchscreen technology funded by 
the CIA back in the 80s, you know, um, uh, GPS funded by, I think it was the Navy in the mm-hmm. 80s, you know, uh, cameras, uh, micro cameras funded by NASA as part of the Apollo mission. Like it, it's just a lot of the actual deep technology in that was publicly funded, taxpayer funded through DARPA, through the CIA, through various other channels, some, some, <laughs> some of which people are suspicious of. Um, and rightly and so. What was done, <laughs> yeah, what, what was done brilliantly is um, taking a design approach to assemble that in the right time in this product. Um, so I see a lot of what entrepreneurs are doing and I, I'd put the same charge towards um, Jeff Bezos or mm. Mark Zuckerberg. They're, they're really um, exploiting the maturation, the mature edge of a cycle of a lot of investment in technology, in mm. the internet. You know, the internet was funded um, publicly by, it was physicists and scientists working on that for decades. Mm. It was only in the 90s that it became, uh, that it was even legal to do anything commercial on the internet. You know? mm. so, so that's where I see entrepreneurs, um, that's their, their, the place they play in the cycle here. Which is actually yeah. a fascinating picture to draw because if you were to, um, if you were to challenge the notion that those particular billionaires or or any other type of entrepreneur from the last 15, 20 years was probably more akin to a very clever assembler of very clever mm. ideas than they were an, an, an inventor, you know. And I mean, everyone knows the whole thing around Jobs and Wozniak and was he ever the inventor in the first place, da, da, da. But mm. non, nonetheless, I think that it, it, it draws a parallel for me to what we are seeing within enterprise, which is... <coughs> People are looking around for Lego bricks because they don't want to build any Lego bricks themselves. They're not. They they just want to assemble based mm. on what they've got in front of them. And if what they've got in front of them isn't good enough, they're not prepared to venture into the chaos mm. and invent something or tell a new story or try something new. So mm. it's almost like the model has been baked well within the system that innovation or entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship is is very assembly focused to a certain extent, even if that's just cognitively yep. hidden. Yeah, well, I think I think we need to make a distinction there between genuine like scientific breakthroughs mm. or as Peter Thiel would say, going from zero to one, you know, mm. the, the first version of something and then creating a new product or service or process. Um, I, I think companies should be doing that. And I mean, let's look at Amazon for, for example, because they're one of the most innovative companies. I found they weren't, to my knowledge, they weren't doing scientific breakthroughs and deep science, but they invented a a whole heap of products, many of which didn't work. I mean, the Kindle, what was it, the Fire Phone. Remember, they tried to launch a phone. There's something called Amazon, total total fail, you know, as Microsoft's phone was. They just couldn't get into the market. Um, They launched something called Amazon Auctions Mm -hmm. back in 2000s. Total fail. It was trying Mm -hmm. to take on eBay. So... There's a slide. There's another slide I've got in the deck with like, um, you know, it's something. It's about fifty uh, failed innovations that Amazon launched. It took them that to find uh, Amazon Web Services was one of those innovations. Was one of those experiments. Turns out, if they spun that, it would probably be worth almost as much as Amazon. You know, yeah. like it's it's. So there there is a kind of Darwinian process you need to go through at the product and service level by which you, I mean, why I say Darwinian is because there's a blind dimension to evo- to evolution in that sense. You can't necessarily know mm. beforehand which ones are going to work. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Yep. I mean, even highly creative people, I mean, this is this is some work of Dean Simington has demonstrated this. Um, you know, the Beatles couldn't tell which one of their songs was going to be a hit beforehand. Mm. You know, Bach couldn't tell which one of his um, fugues. So even even creators themselves often can't tell which of their inventions or creations is going to be a masterpiece. They just have to produce them and it's actually the, the context, the exterior context that decides that, you know. That's but, why uh, the distinction I'd make about that is, yes, companies should be inventing products. Should they be getting into deep science and frontier research? Mm-hmm. That's probably a less, um, a less uh, high probable, high return game. Yep. You know, we can get into why that is, but g- mm. keep going. Mm. And um, I think yeah, the other thing is Amazon's probably one of the very few companies, you know, companies talk about this all the time is, you know, innovate, you know, innovate, fail fast, explore, experiment. And a, a lot of the time I find that's generally 
it's it's words it's and when service, it comes yeah. to yeah it's lip service and as soon as it comes to a product failing you know everybody's oh my god you lost all this capital but amazon seems to be one of those companies that's quite rare that actually puts their money where their mouth is and actually supports things through to their failure without the consequences that come off the other end of it yeah. um yeah. And it's been really interesting to see that because we see it in companies so much that everyone goes, you know, everyone should be innovating, everyone yeah. should be doing this. But then when it doesn't work, you know, the first thing you're doing is talking to the general manager about why you wasted all that capital and then you're over in the corner, um, not allowed to talk to anyone for six months. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the primary thing. Remember, Amazon was considered a failure for years, right? Mm. Like, I mean, it didn't make any money. It was it, mm. he, he was made fun of right from right in the beginning. I mean... You know, made fun of in the New York Times. Who's going to buy books online? You know, and he, yep. he didn't. He wasn't all buff back then, right? And firing rockets. He looked like this kind of nerd burger um, <laughs> that had just escaped from the library. Yeah. And um, so he's talking about the internet, you yeah. know. And so, um, but if they hadn't of, you know, what's interesting is if they had of, if Amazon had have gone bankrupt before they found AWS and other things, you know, in say 2003 or so it probably would have been a story of here's a crazy company that bought all these, you know, mm. pets.com type um, e-commerce startups at the time and tried all this stuff and it didn't work and isn't Bezos. You know, he, 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 the way that we look at the, um, the founder of WeWork now, you know, is this kind of uh, charlatan, mm. or at least the way I do. Mm. He could have been seen that way. It's just that they were persistent enough and, you know, had access to enough capital to keep going. Mm. Yep. But your, your point, I think, is well taken that, there's a lot of lip service given to this stuff, but unless, I mean, you actually have to encourage a process internally that is Darwinian or market-like, you is, know, that there's... Is that, know. Not, is that not part of what, just to go back to the start of our conversation, is that not what Y Combinator developed such a good reputation for? Is that Darwinian process for ideas and putting people through an incubator that really pushed whether or not this thing was even going to survive? I think so. I mean, I think that that region of Silicon Valley and California did that more generally, culturally. Mm. I mean, it's shifted now, I think, because it's things have got so expensive and some of the governance, California has gone pretty bonkers. So everyone's it, so nice. It would be interesting to see. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if they're able to maintain that. But th there's a very yeah. good book on this back um, in the 90s called, again, God, it's hard when you have to do this on the fly. Mm. You know, yeah. yep. A very good book. I've got it on my, on my Kindle <laughs> right here somewhere. I have to to look um but she compares um the route 66 but let's let's get the subtitle um she compares uh here we go regional advantage by annalise Saxenian. um and it's i like it because it's an ethnography it's the kind of research that that i did in my phd mm -hmm. she she spends time around um mit and the sort of east coast and then compares that with time on the west coast and she, she basically makes an argument about culture. You know, what was different about these places around Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the, um, Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. present-day Silicon Valley. But remember, she's doing this in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And she documents just a lot more openness and kind of network dynamic in the culture. You know, people in Cambridge, her version is people are very secretive. Um, there's this idea of old-school innovation pipelines, you know, big government funds, uh, something. It it develops technology, then that's all locked up in patents and pushed. And she, she contrasts that with people that are working from competitor companies, but they're carpooling together, talking about ideas. You know, there's these famous restaurants and stuff where people are openly, I, I guess it's an argument for open innovation. Mm. She doesn't necessarily use that term, but they're engineers fascinated by problems, sharing insights. And also the, the social network dynamics are such that people are hopping companies a lot. So to, to, again, just to finish that point, um, so I think Y Combinator tapped into a lot of that, you know, it tapped mm. into a lot of high talent. It's not that Paul Graham and, you know, sh certainly they put them through um, a good process, mm. um, but they, they were acting as a focal point to attract um, to the best companies in the world, the best entrepreneurs, um, and then pump them up with good capital, you know, experienced people with networks mm. and um, a lot of money. So that, that certainly helps. It's hard to do that from Ballarat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it certainly does. <laughs> Absolutely. I wonder if that's a good way to pivot into a conversation about org design because um, one of the things I'm thinking about is uh, one, of this, one of the things this is making me think about is that um, easy on people, hard on ideas type culture that... Yeah that a lot of entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs or innovators aspire to create 
and almost what we've come to term the uh, the immune system of an organization that doesn't necessarily want to be all that hard on ideas or wants to, you know, sit the golden goose on the mantelpiece and say, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's going to be okay, um, mm. rather than actually being that Darwinian with the process and taking a portfolio approach and trying a bunch of things and setting a whole bunch of people up for success and failure at the same time and seeing what happens. Mm. Yeah. Look, what I think one mm. really good, Jules, is maybe just to talk about the research for your PhD as well because I yeah. think that's really That'd probably critically relevant to the following on conversation about org design because, you know, some of the stuff that you were doing around, you know, uh, remote work and and remote organisations at that time was, you know, that's when it was pretty much just emerging here in Australia mm. anyway. Mm. I realise I, I, I have long answers to things, don't I? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so the first point, good thing. Uh, I'll, I'll say, first, Dave, just to say something about org design. So it's easy to say you need to encourage an internal Darwinian-like process mm. if you want to create an organisation that doesn't reject novel ideas and novel ideas with little that are uncertain. But mm. If they're not uncertain, they're not, in, they're not going to be innovative, right? Yep. So innovation is characterised by change that adds value. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's, if it's under uncertain conditions. Um, the, yeah, like, I mean, I see most larger, the, the larger a company gets, the less it's, it tends to do this instinctively. Like if you're a startup, you kind of have to do that because that's what you're doing. You know, mm. You're mm. creating something new usually. Um, it's a, a sort of inertia process that creeps in the bigger you get the older you get just like a human body you know we get as we get older we tend to get a little bigger and uh, slow down a bit you know there's a there's a sort of um a natural life cycle process it does seem to be counteracted um and it is theoretically possible to counteract because cities fascinate in a fascinating um sort of physics sense, they don't do this. They get bigger and older and um, can still be just as innovative. In fact, more innovative the bigger mm. and often older they are. Yeah. Um, There's so a bit of research into the density of a city and its yeah. and its relationship with innovation, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Density and diversity is, yep. is basically the two. In fact, I've got a colleague that works specifically on this issue and they just found, they just had a big paper published on this looking at density of um, parts of the city, diversity of educational background and openness, actually, the psychological trait of openness. Yeah, cool. And the way, while their research doesn't disclose the exact mechanism, you know, it's statistical analysis, my um, hypothesis on that is because ultimately what drives innovation, and, and this is, to get a bit philosophical, this is... Um, not even limited to hum the things humans do. This is kind of a property, I would say, of the universe is uh, informational interaction. So if you have more diverse set of information mm -hmm. uh, interacting more dense, so you can think of an ecosystem, greater diversity of species or genes mm -hmm. interacting, you're going to get, I mean, look, unfortunately, we're seeing it with the Delta virus, right? Yep. If you've got a greater density of um, viral mutations in India or wherever it is, and lots of those muta mutations, lots of those transmissions, you'll get these new um, variants emerge. And I would say ideas are no different. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not by accident that cities like New York, where you've got, um, or, or San Francisco for that matter, or London, where you've got highly dense cities with a lot of diversity, a lot of people from different parts of the world. And it's, it's not just anywhere in those cities, it's the inner parts often. They are the most innovative places on the planet if you measure by our conventional measurements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that information sharing is what um, leads to that, but not through a directed process. This is the point about Darwinian. It's not that, you know, there's some innovations are standing up saying, you guys, be innovative, you guys. And in fact, if you try and do that, you tend to slow down the natural process or interfere with it. Um, so that's the challenge for company dynamics, right? Ultimately, you need to curate your both your internal dynamics in a company and your networks in an ecosystem to encourage the same sort of process of, you know, informational exchange, novel combinations of ideas, mm -hmm. you know, kind of ideational promiscuity. So mm -hmm. you get these new variants. The, the problem is usually there's a lot of incentives to do that in some places and run with it in a city because if you come up with a great idea and embed that in a great company that you have ownership over, you can make a lot of money, you know, you can be famous. Yep. The, the, often the incentives to do that in a company versus just doing 
the job that you're paid to do and have all, you know, it, it, at least in Australia, the incentives usually land on the other side that it's yep. just much easier to collect your super, collect the pay packet, <laughs> not ask too many questions, not stick your head above the parapets and keep doing it, right? Whereas there's a lot of risk, um, you know, both financial and, and reputational on doing the, the innovative thing. So, mm. so we, we see a tendency away from that. Um, I'll pause for a second. I'm happy to talk about co-working and remote work and, yeah. and the other stuff. But I, I think the other thing too is that what limits innovation in the way that you're talking about it in organisations is people get af- like afraid of that someone else when they're innovating or collaborating with someone else taking their idea. And yeah. so you get this really hesitant uh, kind of theme in organisations where they'll collaborate with someone or they'll collaborate on an innovation up to a certain point in a JV or something and then when it's coming to the pointy end where it turns into a product, everyone kind of pulls back because yeah. everyone feels like that idea is, you know, that person's going to steal their idea and therefore the, the you know, the money that can be made from it. So it's, it's you know, the genuine capacity to innovate and work together really gets stemmed towards the end when you're getting towards generating a product or a service. Mm. Um, I've seen totally, it. Totally, totally. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the point Annalise Saxenian makes in that book, Regional Advantage. That's the primary difference she attributes to the Cambridge, Massachusetts region, the region versus the West Coast. She said they're much more open yep. culturally for whatever historical reasons of hippies and, you know, um, land or whatever it is, um, to sharing. And therefore, she's saying this is a primary factor in creating an environment that is more innovative. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I mean, the worst thing you can do is everybody shuts down and stops sharing and gets yep. defensive, right? Um, you've just got to have faith to some degree that um, being in a more fecund environment is just going to be better for everybody. It's a non-zero-sum game. Yep. Mm. Um, do you, uh, well, remote work, you know, dispersion, co-working? Yeah, so talk talk maybe us. just talk about your, your research to start with. That's probably mm. a great idea and, you know, a- around sort of the whole emergence of co-working I think is really interesting because that was before before the virus and before the pandemic thrust us into the environment where, you know, organisations at the moment, from my experience in working out in the sort of in, in the world of consulting is there's kind of two, two direct camps. There's the camp number one is we're just going to sit back and we're going to wait and then when the pandemic goes away, we're just going to go back to the traditional way of working that we've always been doing and then you've got kind of category number two, which is really, okay, this is an opportunity, a springboard to sort of embed all these things that we've been talking about because yeah. prior to the pandemic, God, if I hear another person talk about the future of work but doing nothing about it, um, you know, it, it would, it'd be the end of me. So there <laughs> seems to be these definitely, depending on the, the organisation and then we can have a talk about possibly the dynamics in organisations about mm. why, what are the factors that either make you a cat A or a cat B company yeah. and about where you're going. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a lot to say on this topic and where to start. So I, I did my PhD uh, from about 2012 to 2018 as an ethnography of principally the fir- <laughs> one of the first co-working spaces in Melbourne, you know, okay. the Hub Melbourne. Yep. Although, so when I began, there were four co-working spaces in Melbourne. There was Inspire Nine in Richmond, co- uh, Hub Melbourne in the city, York Butter Factory in the city, and one called a, a little one called Electron Workshop in North Melbourne at least four that were, you know, known about publicly. Um, and the last I looked, there were like 150 or something, right? So it's clearly an area that had, um, although no doubt many of the smaller ones won't have survived the pandemic. Um, that's actually where I met Pete doing this. Um, and I did it like an anthropologist would go into a village. So I did ethnography. Ethnography is um, the way that the the sort of research technique that anthropologists would use when they'd go into a small village, you know, somewhere on the other side of the world and try and understand the culture. So it's it's watching what people do, it's interviewing them, it's trying to make sense of how the culture works and it's it's been used in, in studying organisations and management too. Um, but as part of that, I had to read about the history of uh, telecommuting, as it was called in the 70s, and, and remote work, which is quite interesting. I mean, it goes... Mm. The, the term telecommuting was first used in the 1970s um, and it was it was it emerged by a guy <laughs> my morning names I, I know the guy very well I've written an article about him uh, last year in the conversation but his name escapes me um, 
but he was a physicist and he was driving to work in LA traffic one day in the um, OPEC oil shock, you know, 1973 when mm-hmm. petrol prices soared up and there was all this sort of, what are we going to do about this um, oil? And he said, this is crazy. I mean, we're, we're driving in on this fr- crowded freeway um, to sit there and manipulate information um, and as Peter Drucker later said in the 80s, why do we bring bodies to information? Why don't we bring information to people? Mm-hmm. So there, there was just an assumption by some of the futurists back then. Alvin Toffler was another one, wrote all about the electronic cottage. There was just an assumption that by now, most people wouldn't be commuting around, that mm-hmm. we'd, we'd have you know, the, the, the notion of the electronic cottage. We do what you, guy, you and I are doing now. You, you might be in a, I'm at my home. Yep. Um, we, we'd have computers and we'd manipulate information and we'd have 3D printers or whatever if we needed products. And for people looking at this, it was a source of real puzzlement why it, it actually, the dial didn't move very much for, for years. You know, it always hovered at this kind of um, below 10% of the workforce is able to do this. Um, a small handful of companies um, embrace it, but the majority of management culture is resistant to it. And what's particularly interesting when you think about that is for most of history, we didn't have something called management. I mean, we didn't have big organisations that people turned up. I mean, people clearly, I mean, Indigenous people clearly worked. I mean, they, they found food and, you know, but they didn't necessarily, they didn't have a boss and they didn't have nine to five. And so most of human labour experience wasn't under these nine to five type conditions of, mm. you know, this idea that if, unless you've got a boss man kind of screw, surveilling you and, you know, rattling the 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 stick the nightstick on the cage like a prison warden that people aren't going to work right um this is quite this is a 20th century idea um primarily you know it's it's only really in the 20th century that we've had large organizations um so i I just think that's always important to say because we talk about this as if it's a new phenomenon right in in many ways it's returning to a a kind of normal state of how most humans have um Mm. organized their working lives even medieval peasants or whatever it was right so it kind of stayed at this level and a lot of a lot of talk was well we just need one more technology you know but back in the 80s they were saying we've got everything we need to do this if you've got a phone and then a fax machine you know and a, a computer you can do it um and then in the 90s it's like well now we've got the web it's going to happen right and I was like, well, mm. in the 2000s now we've got kind of web <laughs> 2.0 and cloud software and and you know zoom and stuff it's going to happen but it didn't it took a global pandemic to the size of the 1918 flu spanish flu to run the biggest work from home experiment we've ever done around the world um and i think what it's revealed is um most working people most workers prefer to have choice and not have choice right Mm. that working from home doesn't work for everybody as the optimal mode uh, especially when you throw in homeschooling and kids, yeah. and, you know, two people in a cramped a house, and there's a lot of other, you know, conditions around this that haven't made it ideal. But almost no one wants to be forced to go back into a, um, you know, surveilled mandatory management situation mm. if they don't have to. That a lot of people say they'd like to choose to do it. You know, um, you know, like I'd, I'd like I, I I would go in. Um, the people that are most worried about this tend to be middle managers mm. because they they derive a lot of their power from um, that sort of inter- information intermediary and soft surveillance and you know I mean it, it, I, I've spoken with companies where the CEO loves the idea they're, they're looking at the productivity statistics and the well-being statistics and going this is we've had our best year in 2020 mm. not 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 across the board I'm just saying some companies including yep. companies that. I wouldn't have thought would embrace this. They're quite conservative, you know, but they, they wouldn't, have, they certainly wouldn't have done it if they weren't forced to. And then they've just gone, holy moly, we could slash, you know, 30% or 40% of our real estate bill mm. um, and or take all of that savings. And people seem to be happier. But the people in the middle that, that sort of like to have that touch point control of the team and feel important and, and kind of giving middle managers a pretty hard rap here often they don't like it because they're like, well, I don't know what people are working on. And it, it's, mm. it's like, well, that's, that's time to update your software, dude. Yeah. Like it's time to, <laughs> yeah. you know, your mental software, your managerial software. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there for a second because there's a lot in there, but I can go through what the research says or, mm. you know, we can talk more about co-working and, and the future of offices um, if yeah. it's of interest. Yeah, look, 
I think what you've spoken about is correct around middle management and a lot of people, and you know, I was listening to another podcast the other day where they were saying like, middle managers don't know what to do because because yeah. the structure of working mm. from home for people has given left this big vacuum right in the middle of organisations and they're kind of all those things that they used to, the meetings that they used to wander on into and, as you said, be the informational sort of controllers, that's all gone now. And so they're kind of wandering around twiddling their thumbs and whether they're in a place of, of loss and trying to find out, well, what, what do I do now that that I don't, I'm not in control yeah. of all this information and these people? Yeah, I mean, I tried to break down, I, I taught a class on managing remote teams this year um, and, you know, it was, it was a new class so I had to develop all the content and I, at one point I broke down the office into a set of different functions. You know, what, what does a physical office actually do? And, you know, at the top you've got people create documents in offices, right? Like, and that used to literally be typewriters and analog. I mean, everything was pre-digital, right? So, yeah. I mean, before typewriters it was Scriveners and dudes with scrolls and shit, you know, <laughs> the 19th century and counting houses. Yep. Um, so it, it went from that to the typing pool and, you know, we create documents. Okay, one. Well, no one says we should use a typewriter anymore, right? Like everybody's mm. doing that. If, if they're doing that in an office, they're doing it on Microsoft Word or whatever. Clearly digital. The next thing we do is we store information in offices and we've had filing cabinets and so st document storage, but we've clearly moved that m most organizations to the cloud or... Yep. You know, if they're still on dial-up servers, servers, good luck, you know. Yep. I, <laughs> so, I was going to say, have you been it, looking around in Australia when you say most people are up <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, cloud? Yeah, it's, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then well, you've got well, I mean, senior... That's kind of the, the next thing to do, right? It's yep. like, uh, just get one drive, dudes. Yeah. Um, and then you've got senior executives then, going, well, what about if there's, it's a clear day and we, there's no clouds? How are we going to get my <laughs> documents? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you got document storage. The <laughs> next thing, uh, let's see if I can do all this from memory. Well, we, we meet in offices. You know, we have meeting rooms and we mm -hmm. and we, we make decisions and faff about, do whatever you do in, in meetings, you know, posture and, and waste time or um, <laughs> actually share information and make decisions. So there's, uh. both things happen. And yeah. now, again, I think pre-pandemic, everyone, so many people, 90% or plus would have said, oh, no, you, you, it's much better if you're in the room. And to some degree, it, I mean, there are certain things, I think, where it is better if you're in the room. But we've all seen you can get a lot of it through forums like this, right? Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of things you can actually do. So, yeah. okay, let's, we've moved meetings digital into Microsoft Teams and Zoom. And the, um, the, the other thing we do in offices is have kind of informal conversations. Mm. So, like, asking a question, you know, ad hoc. And that is, that's a really important part of it, especially when you don't know what you're doing. If, you, if you're early on in your career, you know. Like there, there, are, there are legitimate reasons not to know mm. and there's illegitimate ones like as well. Like you don't know what you're doing and, you, <laughs> yeah. you know, you've been employed for 30 years and you've just hidden it. Um, the, God, we're getting catty this morning. This yeah. is great. Um, <laughs> the, but this is the reality of the conversation. And, you know, so w w we've got digital tools that have tried to move into that space from Yammer to Slack to Teams to, you know, and now the, the, they come, they're a bit of a double-edged sword, I think. It's not great for productivity if you've got Slack beeping at you all day. Mm. Um, but in terms of they're better than email for the short, sharp thing. And then you've got this hard final space, I would say, that digital tools are trying to get in on, but which is kind of rich, collaborative, creative work. You know, the mm. sort of stuff that whiteboards and post-it notes are helpful yep. for. Miro. And, you know, we've got Miro and, yeah, yeah we've got mural. digital tools, Mural moving into that space. But I think most people would say, it's not quite as good. I mean, there are some benefits to it because you don't have to take photos and it's there. Um, mm. But it's we, we get maybe that'll get better when we get augmented reality in that. But that, that um, but then there's some negative things. It, these to me are the largely the positive things we used offices for, right? The negative aspects were surveillance and prestige. You know, mm. so surveilling what people are doing. And I, I would say, you know, you can do that digitally. You can install soft spy software and stuff, but it's not a good idea. I mean, if, if, you have, if that's your decision making, you're going, we're going to spy on our staff. I think you've got bigger problems than what software to purchase. You know, you've got, <laughs> you're, yes. you're hiring the wrong people. You're yep. thinking about it wrong. You're in the wrong industry. Not um, to mention the ethics. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Unless you're actually some Israeli tech firm in the sector of spying on people, uh, you know, yeah. you shouldn't be thinking about that. And even the Israelis shouldn't. Um, yeah. the, 
And then the other things officers did, which is also what pisses off middle managers and stuff, is they structured prestige. So, you know, big office, corner office, mm. Monty Burns with his golden keys to the golden bathroom. Remember that episode of Simpsons where Homer, <laughs> Homer mm-hmm. gets the, 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 the executive bathroom and there's yeah. kind of masseurs and, you know, um, Greco-Roman fountains and things. <laughs> so uh, officers, officers visualize and reified uh, organizational hierarchies. Um, and so that wasn't that didn't feel very good if you're at the bottom of that hierarchy because mm-hmm. you're in the kind of big pen you've got a locker or whatever you know filing in. But the the further you ascended that hierarchy, the more you got to reinforce the fact that you you're you know the big man on campus or whatever it is. And if you, suddenly you give everybody um, a, 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 an office with a view and a private bathroom, i.e. their home. Um, and I full just you know full acknowledgement that not everybody's homes equal. Some people yeah. don't have ideal setups. Um, but look, if you don't, if you've got a decent job, it, all you need is really a room, a decent computer, and your bathroom. You know, you've and your kettle and your fridge. Um, it actually takes away a lot of that prestige gradient or that prestige distinction. Mm. So it's another reason people don't like it if they've if they've worked twenty five years to get the the big office and the the gold thing on the door. That's suddenly you just that. go nab says. We're going to sell our building. We don't. We don't need it. Um, yeah. So I think that's what's going on too. I mean, we can get into the details of productivity and collaboration and stuff too. If that's well, interesting. Just just to speak on collaborative uh, collaboration and productivity and that sort of stuff. Um, it, one thing I'm thinking about is what we've learned just in the last mm. the call it eighteen months of doing this, or on a on a big quantitative scale. Um, you know, uh, longitudinally across across the planet. Um, it struck me, I sat in a meeting yesterday that was calendared for an hour and at about 20 minutes I thought, yeah, we've got about five minutes to go. And then the cadence of the meeting shifted on point to make sure that this thing edged towards the landing zone and landed on 58 minutes flat. And mm. I, I, I wonder, has there been any research or anything done that you're aware of that, that talks to... You know this this new paradigm we're in, where people are setting meetings and and learning about having to do this on a much more fixed calendar because that's what a digital space needs is a fixed calendar, and then almost managing their cadence to that fixed calendar, even rather than as you mentioned before, boiling it all back to first principles and getting it down to actually we've got everything we need. This is forty minutes early. Let's just call it and move on. Oh yeah, there's there's lots of research and there's lots of non-published insights no doubt with Mm. companies and i could say a lot to that so i mean one of one of the most well-known and interesting studies on working from home in general first of all there's been tons you know good bad and and look a a good meta-analysis that looked at i don't know 30 to 50 different papers on this concluded that people like it people prefer it because of perceived autonomy no one likes being told what to do um People are no less productive in general, and um, and yet there are some issues that come up. You know, work managing work life boundaries. Many studies found people work more hours at home than mm-hmm. less hours. You know, yeah, I heard that. Um, con- perceived conflict with partners. You know, and, and the, the research is complex because it's on one level um, often it's better if you've got kids and stuff. It is better to be at home. Certainly, had many dads saying. Um, and, you know, partners, I'm just singling out dads because I'm thinking of um, one one friend who's, uh, well, she's female, but her husband's an electrician. And in after the forced lockdowns, he's like, I kind of want to change career because I want to be working from home around the kids, you know, like I've, mm. I was always up early on. So, you know, but then there's there's, there's other tensions around that of, of kids, you know, if the parents in the house um like having to create those boundaries. I mean, I was on a meeting the other way and said, I'm just going to lock my, lock my door because I can hear my kids outside. And, you know, <laughs> I've, I've, we've all been kind of BBC dad bombed. Uh, those, yep. you know, come in and holding the cat. It's or funny to think about that BBC video now, right? Like that was yeah, such a so funny, such a funny yeah. video at the time. And now yeah, it's no. like, uh, it's normal. <laughs> no, this happens, yeah, this happens yeah. three times a day. Yeah. Um, but what I was going to say, there's a very, uh, quite a well-known study now by Nicholas Bloom out of Stanford, an economist in 2014 or 15, um, where they did like a, a, a split test, like a randomized controlled trial of an organization. This is very hard to get an organization to agree to do, you know. So they basically went, it was a Chinese company, call center company, and randomly allocated, um, you know, half of their staff to work from home and half in the office. Here's what they found. The, the people that work from home on average were 13% more productive 
mm-hmm. um, they had a 50% less um, quit rate, so they, they didn't leave. Um, and they were generally happier, like they, they did well in the wellbeing statistics. When they let people choose where they wanted to work, because remember they were just randomly allocated at first, um, the, the productivity went up to 20%. The reason for that is not everybody is suited to working from home. So mm-hmm. 13% was average, but some were probably less productive, right? Mm-hmm. It's just on average it came up. When you got the people that acknowledged they weren't good at it or needed to go into the office, back into the office, it went up more. However, what was fascinating is half the people, even the people that were good at it and said they liked it, when they were given the choice, chose to come back into the office. And one of the principal reasons was they were worried about promotions and they were worried about perception. Mm. Um, so the, the evidence on this is quite strong. There's two caveats, though. It was simple work. One of the reasons they were able to measure productivity so quickly or so well is because it was call center work. So they weren't writing software. They weren't you know, writing academic papers. or They, they weren't doing what we call non-routine complex work. It was mm. taking calls, and they could clearly say, well, how many have they taken per hour? Mm. And they attributed the increase in productivity, uh, interestingly, largely to the faffing about that happens in an office, interruptions, the meeting overdues, so someone's birthday and you stop for cake. And Easier to measure because it it, the value is created in real time, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's each hour you can, that's much harder to do when you're doing the kind of work we, we all, many of us do, right? Mm. Like, mm. Um, you know, if you're an artist, well, you don't measure in hourly units how many strokes you've put on. You say, well, how good is that painting or how good is that song, you know? Yeah. I had a couple um, of conversations with people last year talking about that and they thought, they were having some form of identity crisis during the pandemic because they thought their job was operational in nature. Their job was to get to work and perform. And so they were performing yeah. and routining inside of something where value was created at a much longer time horizon. And so they would, they would create faster cycles and rock up and perform within a day thinking that the value mm. was created in real time only to then have the team create the value one month down the track, three months down the track, a year down the track by way of this project or whatever. And this pandemic has forced them into a space where they're unable to perform. They're in this fixed calendar. They only show up to meetings they're invited to. They can't wander in or crash into people. They can't do any of that operational performance. And instead they're left going, well, do I provide any value? And the, the conversation led to becoming more about time horizons and value creation and thinking mm-hmm. about your role differently than it did about whether or not mm-hmm. they're creating any value at all. And I don't, don't think, too, that you can underestimate the mental shift required to go from uh, organisational performance as a stage performance to go into that long-term horizon mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. value mm-hmm. creation. Like, that's a significant shift that, I, you know, I don't, I don't think... Everyone is possible <laughs> it has the possibility to make. I yeah. think. Well, mm. the opportunity is always there. It's just whether the will is there to make the difference to make that shift. Mm. There's sort of an output outcome distinction. I hear there too. Like in some way, that's interesting. I, I genuinely haven't spoken to people like that. Although it doesn't surprise me now that you say it, because it seems to me a lot of human capital is is locked up in the fat of organizations and some of it is productive some of it's actually useful and you discover it's useful when you take them out you know and then you go ah they were Mm. they were providing an important kind of um lubricant type function to Mm. teams or people um and we we couldn't see that so we 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 made them redundant and now we realize they were Mm. no doubt some is not productive it's just kind of taking theatrical space it's it's putting meetings in calendars and saying stuff at the right time and giving advice that isn't particularly helpful and feeling like you're doing stuff. It may, it may not even be that yeah. obvious to the person that it's not, but we've just associated kind of white collar or bureaucratic work with a lot of time taken up talking and, and writing emails. Mm. And, you know, my, it, it's harder for me to relate to because in academia, it's actually pretty clear, like how much have you published this year? You know, mm. and it's the publications are either accepted or not. You know, mm. and that's that's a major metric. It's quite. It's like, did you hit the, did you did the basketball go in the hoop or not? Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of invisible stuff under the surface of what it takes to get a publication across the line. Mm. You know, a lot of analysis, a lot of getting funding here or talking to that person here or reading this here. Um, 
but there's quite a clear measurement on what we're actually judged on. Mm. There's um, a guy who plays for the LA Lakers, or at least he did. I'm not sure. I think he still is. I have to look that up. It's all it's the middle of trade season at the moment, so who knows? Um, his name is Jared Dudley, and um, he's exactly what we're talking about. They, he's not your standout performer. He doesn't spend a whole lot of time on the court, but statistically speaking, the teams do better when he's in the locker room. Yeah, it's interesting. And yeah. so he gets hired to be around the team and to be a part of the team, even though he doesn't perform yeah. on the court and they pay him. I mean, it's NBA handsomely comparatively to everyone else, probably not getting paid very much at all, but handsomely um, to be a part of the ecosystem and to, like you mentioned before, to be the lubricant and to be that kind of contributor. I think it's quite a legitimate role. And I mean, there's notions like emotional labor and these other things mm. that are provided Um and yeah, you may not be the guy dunking um, and getting the highlight reel, but you're you're either actively on the court doing things, setting up plays, passing, calling, or even potentially in the locker room, like the vibe in training. The you know the um, I don't want to cheapen it to say it's like a lucky mascot or something, but you can provide um, value that's more or less visible. Let's yep. put it that yep. way. Yeah. But you, you guys asked oh, about your question about the calendar. Um, mm. My thing just changed. Oh yeah. Yeah, so Matt, um, or just to, to, to round out the, the 13% sure. productivity bump. So that's a fairly robust paper, but it was one company and a particular kind of work. There was another paper that came out last year looking at, um, sorry, came out this year, just a few months ago, looking at Asian, it didn't disclose where, an Asian um, software development firm. And they found their productivity hadn't declined under remote work but they were taking longer, so well, their, their output hadn't declined, but people were working longer hours. So, you know, if you, yep. basically the productivity had declined because it was taking more time. Yep. But I think this goes to your point. I don't think that that has to be the case. I think what a lot of companies do is they try and transfer what they were doing in the room directly online. So mm -hmm. if they met a certain way, their meeting structure, you mm. know, synchronously in the room for an hour, they just, their day turns into a set of endless Zoom or Teams mm. calls where they're sort of talking, you know, at people for an hour. And that's like the worst way to do <laughs> distributed work, you know, like yep. you, you, it's a silly, I mean, we, we kind of do this intuitively even when you, the, the file structure, you, the icon, you know, in Windows looked like a filing cabinet. Mm. So we do this all the time. We take the analog representation and move it into a digital format. Now, the architecture in a computer is what's actually going on is is not like a filing cabinet, right? It's other things, but we we use these visual metaphors, and some of them can be helpful. But we make a a, a mental like I'll give you a better example than that. Um, Encyclopedia and Carta versus Wikipedia. Mm. So when we tried to put encyclopedias into a digital form, the first thing we did is we reproduced. Encyclopedia Britannica, and we just put it on CD-ROM back then, mm -hmm. if you remember them. It was a mm -hmm. big thing, Microsoft and Carter. Yeah. So we just... And then it, it took a little while for Jimmy Wales and others to say, actually, no, the way to do encyclopedias with the internet is to do it like Wikipedia, where you have this living document where it's open and editable, but we, we have a culture that of expertise that know about the pages that edit those back if they're erroneous. And, mm -hmm. you know, that that's clearly just a much better way to do online encyclopedias than paying to write a page because yep. you, you can't do it right and i think there's an analogy with working in a distributed sense like the first you want to do it as much as you can asynchronously than synchronously mm -hmm. right and so that means um documenting things appropriately putting them in formats that are editable and shareable and stop emailing around files you know, with 15 different versions um it means i mean the, the base camp guys um a couple of companies that have been big advocates of how to do distributed management for a long time. One guy's Matt Mullenberg, who from who runs Automatic. He's got a yep. podcast on this, and the other guys are from Basecamp, who've copped a bit of a heat recently. Yeah, they certainly um, have politically. But the but they've been they've written a couple of books on remote management. He he says the two. This is Jason Freed. He's got a TED talk on this. He says the two things we hated and wanted to get away from is M and M's meetings and managers. We didn't want that. We want to, we want to free our people, you know, and he's, he's, his challenge is just take one less meeting a day, right? Mm. You just don't need it. And, and as a company, like scrap most of your meeting for a week and see which ones you really need. Mm. You know, only bring back the ones you actually need. So their thesis is just so much energy and time 
you know, if you've got five people in a meeting, it's not one hour, it's five hours, right? It's mm. five hours of labor, mm. human labor that could be directed to someone put into this thing. And as you said, that could have been done in 20 minutes, mm. but then 40 minutes is just winding the clock down because that's what, that's what the calendar yeah. <laughs> says, you know, that it comes in half an hour or hour blocks. Yeah. And hardly anyone does that cost accounting around meetings. No, I don't think no. they mentally do it. We think no. it's a one hour, it's only one hour out of my day. Well, if mm. there's, I mean, I, I've been in meetings at university where there's like, 20 people on a call yep. you know, mm. in a governance process. And I'm like, this is, um, this is just so expensive. Well, you think about like you, you do a two-minute check-in for 20 people, there's yeah. 40 minutes gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's yeah. like, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. 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 And you get to the yeah. end of the check-in right. and then we even haven't got time for the check-out. <laughs> See ya. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, there's five things I often... I, I actually, one of the few notes I took for this is I was thinking, oh, we'll probably talk about remote work and there's so much to say, but... Five things I like. These are directly from Matt Mullen work. And one of them is move everything you can into clean documentation. He just says document everything. But I, I would add clean because it doesn't mean documents aren't useful. Like the mail is useful if it's 300 pages, mm. right? Like no, mm. um, Atlassian do this very well. If you go on their website, oh, it's I mean, fantastic. They've, they've documented all their processes, but you can read it, most of them in three minutes. But there's an know? anchored principle that sits under that, which is that asynchronous piece right, is yeah. that if I yeah. can come into this on my own time without your help or being together, I can find my way through this. That's where that exactly. clean piece comes from. Yeah. 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 So it should be clean or parsimonious. You mm. want inviolable documentation yep. to understand and it should look nice and all the rest. But your point, it should be ideally it's editable or at least it can be. You know, it's not, mm. you don't want one person controlling you. You have to email them something, you know, ridiculous move all the communications you can online where you can. And the reason for that is what we're seeing now with hybrid is, you know, five people in a room and three people on the call. And that, that rarely works. You know, mm. um, remember the old model, the pre teams thing where you'd have that weird triangle thing in the middle of the boardroom and Star trek like voices coming out of it. Yeah. Oh, yes, could you repeat that, John? Yeah. I, I think you should know, like, um, like that, that shit's just terrible. Um, <laughs> so, the this is i mean the, the principle at play here is if you've got some people that are, are not in the office as much um you don't want to develop a culture that it's highly beneficial to be in the office because there's a bunch of undocumented uncodified sort of know-how and uh dark matter around decisions you don't get if you're whispering in the corridors right mm -hmm. that sort of um little finger kind of game of thrones type political environment is um it's just not ideal for these circumstances because right. then you get a knowledge a strong knowledge power gap between people that aren't there someone might be awesome smart but bright they just live in in you know they live four hours a town and you want that person contributing to your organization um and yeah they, and not being being handicapped by by not listening to little finger um yep. the, <laughs> here you guys watch game thrones right yep. yep the third one is finding the right tools so i think you don't you don't want tons of them you don't want a carpenter to turn up you know carrying such a big bag of tools that they're way down but you want to use you know a lot of that is asynchronous editing you know you want to use the mm. tools that you can um that are in the cloud that are that do the right job and i i think there's room for things like miro to bring into the the awareness of an organization mm. um and then the, the, the next one that's super important is creating productive and useful face-to-face -face time. So don't, when you get together, emphasize, don't do informational things that you could have done online. Do, do the social and cultural, creative and collaborative things that are really are much harder to do online. Build that trust, build that understanding sort of capital that then you can draw down on. Yeah. when you're working remotely. And, and again, that comes back to the conversation we had before around the creation of value in real time versus the creation of value across time. And if you, yeah. if you have a relationship with value creation that is quite real time, you get into a face-to-face -face environment and, and people start going, okay, what are we going to do together? What are we going to create together? What are we going to build together? Yeah. And it can be quite uncomfortable for leaders, let alone people in a team to go, actually, no, you know what? We're just going to hang out today. We're going to go down. We're going to have a lunch. Yeah, exactly. We're going to go yeah. and we're going to go for a walk as a team and just get to know each other a little better. And that can be really confronting for people because they don't know that that's actually something that they're going to cash in and draw down on for the next three months. But that's an excellent point. And we need to. I mean, Matt Marlenberg says, I "Sound like I'm some big fanboy." I'm just got this on my mind. He says most companies spend, you know, what is it, forty eight 
weeks together of their workers working, you know, in the same building but not talking to each other that much mm. or working at their workstation and then two, three, four weeks away on vacation. Mm. We spend the four weeks, you know, working separately wherever they're living. Then we bring people together for two weeks and spend half of that time doing just fun, interesting things because we know we recognize the point you were we get somewhere interesting in the world. Now, clearly, this isn't viable for every company, but you know, somewhere we haven't been before. We we spend half of the time sort of doing, getting everyone on the same page, talking through strategy, and meaning, but half of that time just doing cool stuff like skiing or mm. um, whatever it is. So people are building these relationships. We're basically investing in that, and then we use that, you know, not in a creepy way, but the other forty-eight weeks of the year, we can draw upon that. There's some really good case studies of businesses like e-com businesses that have been distributed long before the um, the pandemic or anything like that where they've had an artist in one country or a photographer or, or a team, you know, you, you're getting boxes packed in one city but the CEO is living in another city or whatever and they've all gone, oh, let's meet up in Bali or let's, let's yep. meet up in Fiji and run. And like you said, half of it will be strategy and conference-esque and then the other half will just be let's – climb a mountain together, let's swim in the pool together, let's drink together, whatever, and just create that. But I have, I've, I've pitched that to clients a couple of times actually and gone, you know, that's the new norm is you're going to spend all this time apart, come together and go somewhere cool like, I don't know, Falls Creek or, or Bali even, you know, when this all blows over and they look at you like, oh, I couldn't do that, that would be too much fun. Yeah, I think... That I- the way to think about that is, well, how much are you spending for needless real estate costs because you think somebody has to spend eight hours at this in front of a real station yeah. to, to employ them? Like, slash your real estate costs, not to down to zero, but and take that money. Don't, don't just buy shares back or whatever or, you know, give your executives bonuses. So like, that's a totally – that will create resentment. Like, say, well, we're going to take this money and we're going to do um, cool stuff together that's – good for our company because yeah. we recognize that um, employees feel great about working here. I mean, and who, who's going to leave a job like that where you get more flexibility to work remotely and once or twice a year, there's like these really cool strategy um, and cultural sessions where as a, as a company, you get to go somewhere new and interesting. Yeah. I mean, staff retention, uh, really on staff retention alone, you could justify the cost. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah. So just because we, we're getting on to an hour now, Jules, so I would, what I'd really yeah, like to talk to. about in the, in the end to close up is just about how you think this, what this means for leadership going forward and what it means for leaders in this kind of new world of new org structures and entrepreneurship and where things are going. Well, it's a big question, right? I mm. mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of things. I mean, there's the, the complexity gap that you and I have, have talked about before, the, the, the issue of how the nature of work and, and other aspects of society are shifting, how to build a, an, an appropriate understanding of that. I think there's increasingly just an ethical... I mean, look at the climate change report, the IPCC climate change report that came out last week. I mean, there's just a growing level of ethical urgency around um, how the private sector is either contributing positively towards the sustainable development goals, the UN or not. And, you know, I, I do think this isn't going to be just a kind of hipster luxury belief thing. I think this is going to be increasingly pressing that um, we, we should, we need to justify um, the contribution we're making and the the uh, the problems, the, the negative externalities of, of our companies. And... Um, but the other thing I'd say is, you know, going back to that deep tech idea, I think, so, so I think we're at the beginning of a new frontier of um, deeper technology that will, deeper I say, you know, more science-based, more advanced engineering-based technology that just as we've seen digital over the last 20 years start to colonise and creep in to solve most areas of business life, you know, from Airbnb to Uber to, I mean, if you're not, if, if you're a company and you're, you don't have, you haven't won the digital way of doing this, and I put a lot of banks and insurance companies here in the, in the firing line now, if you're trading on incumbent power and, you know, um, all of that, those costs absorbed in 
the kind of bureaucratic way of delivering this, um, you, you're vulnerable. Just as we've seen digital channels and delivery mechanisms do that, kind of colonise that space, most of the categories, I mean, I think we'll start to see these deeper technology areas do the same thing over the next 15 years. So what does that mean if you're a company today? You need to position yourself in the right ecosystem because these, these various areas, so when I'm saying areas of deep tech, I'm talking about quantum computing or blockchains or, you know, drone, drones and robotics or what it, whatever it is, you know, biotechnology, synthetic biology, etc. You need to make sure your organization is absorbing the leading developments in that field and positioning themselves in an ecosystem whereby they can take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that might be smart acquisitions. I mean, the big tech giants at the moment have part of the reason they're still there is because they've just acquired the shit out of yeah. any startup. You know, Facebook bought yeah. Instagram and probably the and then WhatsApp and you know, they, probably the most egregious case that one. But Amazon and Alphabet do this all the time. Apple, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. any competitor. And we've just seen Stripe frankly, purchase Afterpay as well. and yep. just, yeah, yeah, we've just yep. seen that, right? So um, if you've got the, the pockets to do that, um, that is one way to do it. I mean, it's not the most fair play. I, I think <laughs> I, I wonder how long that will be able to continue given the Biden's administration's antitrust um, laws because in some cases it just looks like blatantly um, ensuring monopoly power. But whether it's through acquiring actual companies and IP, whether it's through acquiring talent, to build these things or whether it's just keeping an eye on the competition that will knock you, that, that, that'll that likely knock you and displace you out of the market in the next 10 years. Um, I think that's the primary thing they need to be doing. If, if your company doesn't have an active strategy around that about how it's positioning itself into the most vibrant and threatening for your incumbent position ecosystem, mm -hmm. I think you're, you're in danger of, of um, going the way of, of blockbuster video and, you know, Kodak and all the rest that, that we've seen the digital um, upstarts the last 20 years colonize let's, or, or kill. Let's talk briefly about upstarts because um, that's a bit I'm a little bit passionate about is is those people in businesses who aren't privy to the M&A scene and can't buy businesses or don't feel exposed to the areas of the businesses that would be given permission to play, play around with blockchain or whatever and probably have to spend some time leading up and demonstrating progress and reliability in order to get to the places where they can affect lasting change. What What is it that we can say to them or, or, or guide them towards um, in, in terms of helping them be more innovative or deliver change from their perspective or from their position within an organisation? Well, I think it can only work if people are open to leaving, to be frank. I mean, it's not... <laughs> Good it's answer. Not everyone, but, <laughs> you know, like if, if... I mean, let's just think of the bargaining power. If a company knows it's got you by the short and curlies and you're not really going to go and work with a startup or a competitor, they can ignore it. If they see that their smartest, most creative people are ringing the, the, the red flag or the, the end on court about something and then they ignore it and then they go and work with for afterpay or whatever it is, you know, mm. in, in, if you're in banking. I mean, why, why didn't the banks, <laughs> why didn't they create that product, right? Yeah. Why did it take two? Um, well, because they're addicted, a part of it is they're addicted to credit card fees, you know, in the same way that why didn't Blockbuster create Netflix? In fact, why didn't they acquire Netflix? It was on mm. the table because mm. they're addicted to late video fees and they were, well, blah, you know, this upstarts where, you know, look at all our brick and mortar stores. They're never going to be able to compete with that, right? Um, so... On one level, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're talking about the smart individual inside a company, um, capitalism works. The creative destruction of capitalism works when people are willing to, um, to move, you know, yeah. and, and, um, and take a better deal. So that, that's kind of point one. Um, but also there's point two is I think there's a lot of scope for I mean, the, the research project I, I want to start working on next year is looking at how universities and science labs, large corporates that in many cases are these incumbents and startups can work in a more generative way. Mm -hmm. So large corporates often have a lot of things that startups don't. They have access to market. They have, you know, abilities to negotiate regulatory boundaries. They, they have a whole ton of things. They have resources. 
startups often have better ideas and and better talent, not always, but um, an interesting IP, and they've got flexibility about what they can do. You know, um, so we've got to work out a better way for for these relationships to to happen, such that especially in Australia, because we're quite bad at this. I mean, we we score particularly low on um, on collaboration between research researchers and um, business, mm. you know, whether it's the CSIRO or university labs or whatever it is. Mm. Um, and we, we funnel a lot of our support towards large enterprises rather than smaller ones as well, mm. government um, support. So there's, there's, a, there's some scope to change these things. I guess in my mind, I've been thinking more at the policy level here um, rather than what an individual can do. But, you know... Uh, <laughs> my advice for the individual is leave or be prepared to leave yep. um, such that you, you then have a, a more of a bargaining case. You know, yep. Businesses rationally don't want to lose good people. Yep. Oh, good answer. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. That's the end of today's episode. Thanks for listening. What's Next is brought to you by The Next. We are workplace futurists and transformation facilitators. You can reach us on the web at www.thenextnxt.com.au. Please ensure you subscribe to our channel to ensure you don't miss our up-and-coming episodes.